come. I'm worried about sit. Six. If you have a seat next to you, can you please raise your hand and have people please come sit? We're blocking exits and it's not safe. Sounds like my house and dinner. <laughs> guys so much for being here. Someone's got a hand up that means there's a seat next to him, so feel free if you're standing. Um, thank you guys. Oh, I missed you. Uh, <laughs> I'm really just looking around at faces. I can't believe it's been about eight weeks. I've missed you. I'm a little out of practice. I haven't been in front of people for eight weeks, but uh, that'll be all right. Um, I, I want you to know that the four years that I spent at LifeBridge uh, it was an incredible privilege, and I'm so grateful to LifeBridge Church that I've had the opportunity to utilize my spiritual gifts in the way that I was able to do. The, the clarity that I have as to what the church is all about is that each and every one of you would feel the way I do when I leave church on Sunday afternoon. I'm tired, I'm a little sweaty, I want to go be alone, but I'm never more fulfilled in any moment of my week when I've left on Sunday and I've went, God used me to make a difference. in this room that we will keep with us. And the positive aspects that we experienced at LifeBridge are treasures that we will think back about and remember forever. So we're so grateful. So thank you for coming tonight. Um, tonight I'm, I'm going to share some of the history, the recent history of what's happened at the church. And I'm also going to talk about Melinda and I and our family. Hey, what might be next? What are we thinking of doing? Um, I'm also going to share some things that, you know, this isn't a message with a good story at the end, but um, I've been praying hard that the Holy Spirit would lead me to share what I need to share in the right way, and I'm confident that he's going to do that. Uh, but I am going to share, I think it's appropriate for you to hear from me and to understand the events that have happened, I would say, over the last three months, so that you can understand what happened to the church that you were attending, and that you are attending, what, what happened. So I want to give you those details. Um, as I've been praying, uh, two, two Bible verses have jumped out. Uh, Ephesians 4.15, there's a phrase in there that I love. Paul says, speak the truth in love. And so that's my intention tonight, to speak the truth in love. And I want to read Ephesians 4.29-31, and I'm going to ask Melinda to pray. Paul says this, now let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, Amen. by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Hallelujah. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Wanda, would you pray? Father God, we welcome you here. We are so grateful for your presence. We ask for the Holy Spirit to come and sweep through this place. May only your truth, may only your love, and may only your grace prevail. And may your kingdom come in greater ways through our lives and the lives of each and every person in here. May we be fully yielded to you as followers of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So, you know, four years goes really fast. I've been at LifeBridge, had been at LifeBridge for four years. Many of you have uh, predate me. You've been there longer. When I showed up at LifeBridge, uh, there was so much pain. 
There was so much hurt, but there was so much passion at the same time for truth. And there was just some dysfunction going on. And, you know, the, the, the leadership at LifeBridge came to me in late uh, 2016, asked if I'd be interested in interviewing. I said, no, uh, I'm at Discovery Church. I was very happy in my role there. I was challenged by it. And uh, yeah, yeah, about, yeah. yeah about, about three or four months later, uh, LifeBridge came back. So obviously we had the conversation. And um, as we were praying about whether or not we would come and take the job at LifeBridge, I'll just tell you that I have three people who live in Windermere who are good friends of mine, who are more mentor type people in my life. And I told them I was praying about this opportunity. And I don't mean this negative in any way. I'm just, I'm telling you what they told me. They said, Ralph, don't take the job at LifeBridge. Your personality, you will get destroyed there. They will run you over, Ralph. And three people tell me that. At the time that I was praying about it and having those conversations, I was reading the book of Acts. And I was reading about when Paul is on his way to Jerusalem. And everywhere he went, people were warning him, Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Agabus binded him with a belt and said, Paul, you're going to end up in prison if you go to Jerusalem. And Paul said this, you don't understand. I'm willing not only to be bound in Jerusalem, I'm willing to die there. And when I read that, the Holy Spirit said, Ralph, that's your verse. <laughs> and I said, are you sure? <laughs> the Holy Spirit whispered something else into my spirit the way that he does. Before I took the job, he said, Ralph, you can forget your reputation. That was the word the Lord spoke to me before I started my first day of work at LifeBridge. So when I came to LifeBridge, I didn't come... Oh, well, let me say this. I came resolved because I knew God had called me there. I knew that people were hurt. I knew that God brings healing, and I was going to come and, and be a part of what God was doing to bring healing and to move the ministry forward. Um, it was bumpy. It was challenging. Um, my, it was rewarding. Thank you. I, I, and there were so many and are so many wonderful people at LifeBridge, and there were then four years ago. And so I came with a focus and an understanding to, that I needed to repair the heart. Whatever I could do, I needed to be part of repairing the heart of the church. Almost as soon as I got there, I hired Ron Camblin. Uh, Ron, Ron's not an executive who's going to build the organization. Ron Camblin was another shepherd, and we needed a shepherd. We needed, we needed to be healing. That was our focus. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a shepherd, and I'm a healer. I'm not a healer. I'm a shepherd, and I'm an encourager. And that was what God brought to life at that time uh, four years ago. It's okay that it was hard. Every step in the kingdom of God, there's opposition. That's okay. I've had a verse, Isaiah 57, 14, I've had hanging in my, I had hanging in my office for almost the entire four years, and it says this. God says, rebuild the road, clear away the rocks and stones so my people can return from captivity. I looked at that verse almost every single day. Because the image I had in my mind when I came to LifeBridge was a, a bomb had gone off. And I had come after the explosion and there was debris everywhere. And so those first couple of years, it was just a matter of clearing the debris. And again, wonderful, beautiful people at LifeBridge. We just, but a bomb had gone off. And we needed to clear the debris. And, and that was my image. That's what we did in the first two years. You know, we had, I believe, 18 people on staff when I showed up. 14 or 15 of them left pretty quick, like within the first six months, maybe first nine months. And in those first two years, we hired 19 other people onto the staff. So anybody that runs an organization, you know how much chaos that is, right? And trying to get Sunday mornings going and all that kind of stuff. Um, but in the first two years, at about the two-year mark, we reached a point where the attendance had almost doubled, very close to double. Giving had more than doubled. And it was amazing. I walked in one day and I went, it's healthy. It's healthy. We can start to build. And that was just about two years ago. So that's just a little kind of introduction just to where we were. Now, what I want to do as respectfully but as clearly as I can is talk to you about what's gone on in the last three months. By the way, there have been a lot of accusations against me that have come out in the last three months. Some of you may be aware of some or all. I am going to address those. I'm going to try to do them very respectfully as they come up, okay? Um, I think it's appropriate and fair for me to do that. Uh, but here's what happened about three months ago a little more than three months ago, there were three events happening within the context of the leadership of LifeBridge Church that all converged almost at the exact same time. So let me give you just a brief snapshot of the three. The first one was this. Three pastors came to me and said that there was a problem with my leadership. 
that I was playing favorites with Joe Jackson, our pastor Joe Jackson. We had met in China, we had ministered there, we had ministered Discovery, he came to Lightbridge. And they said, Ralph, everybody in the hallway, meaning everybody on staff, knows that Joe can walk down this hallway and he can get whatever he wants from you. And I've heard that before. That's a, that's a theme and a story that's a part of the four years that I've been here. So I said, can you give me examples of that? And so of the three pastors there, one pastor gave one example. And he said, Ralph, we had two, two vision meetings. We had a Friday night vision meeting and a Saturday morning vision meeting. And the staff were told to be there, asked to be there. And Joe skipped the Saturday morning session. And you let him skip it. And all the rest of us had to be here. That was favoritism. So here, here's what happened in that regard. Um, Joe had a commitment with his wife and daughter. And he said, Ralph, I'm going to come Friday night. Would it be okay if I don't come? On Saturday, I said, it's okay. I'll get you any of the notes you need. It's okay. Um, also, John Jackson, who works at the church in our facilities, he had a scheduled um, training over that weekend. He said, can I come Friday and miss Saturday? And I said, yes. And then another uh, person on staff, um, oh, I think I can say the name. I, I want to be careful not to say, but there's no problem. Melissa Sesman was celebrating her father-in-law's uh, 80th birthday on the Friday night. And so she asked me if she could skip Friday and come Saturday. And I said, yes. Uh, nobody else asked if they could skip it. So it's not favoritism, right? So I'm not looking for you guys to support me. Yeah, so, but that's been a consistent, you know, challenge that I've had in my leadership. That, that, that has continued to come. My friendship with Joe Jackson, uh, which, by the way, I think should be celebrated that two pastors would be friends. <laughs> charge against me. So I took that conversation. By the way, that, that conversation happened on February 22nd. So I took that conversation to the elder team. I proactively took it to the elder team. And I said, here's what was told to me by three pastors. Could you look into this? Like, could you go to the staff members and could you literally get examples? Because I, everybody has blind spots and I'm aware I have blind spots. And so, okay, so this is a blind spot. People are saying this. Can you bring tangible examples to so I asked the elders to do that. Um, and then about two meetings later, two elder meetings later, they hadn't really done that, but one of the elders told me that, Ralph, the very fact that you haven't fired Joe is favoritism. They felt like Joe wasn't performing and producing, and I'm not trying to, don't, 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 be, don't react too negative, please. I'm just giving you the data. But they felt like, well, Joe's not producing, which he was. The fact that you haven't fired him means you're favoring him. And then uh, there was a second example. One of the elders talked to a pastor and said, tell us how Ralph favors people. And that pastor said, well, the example, the right word is not really favoritism, it's access. So here's another accusation that's been made against me. Joe is the only person on staff that has access to Ralph. Nobody else has access to Ralph. I see you too, I know you know. So, so what, what I did in that meeting was I opened my calendar, just super quick, Monday mornings, 10 to 11.30, every Monday, I meet with Jeff Lawrence. One o'clock, I meet with Mara Toulinson. Uh, two o'clock, I meet with Luke Lazan. Tuesday, staff meeting at 9.30, message planning at 11, weekly pastoral meeting at 1.30. Uh, other than once the first Tuesday of the month, we meet from 12, and we have lunch, and we extend the time. Uh, Tuesday, uh, Tuesday, Tuesday lunch, uh, I meet with, with Gil. Um, and, uh, and then... Wednesday, I try to keep open for message planning. Thursday, I meet with Lynn Birch at 9. I meet with Joe Jackson every other Thursday at 10. I meet with Ron Camblin at 11 every Thursday. And then Justin Melton and I, our schedules are hard to, we've had different days and times, and we, but, 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 but by the time I left, we were meeting on Thursdays at 1.30. That was my weekly schedule. So, uh, you know, I didn't appreciate being told that nobody had access to me. But what I'm saying is there were three events that converged. And this conversation with me and the elders, and I say respectively, it created further tension with us. Because I was saying, listen, if there's no examples, it's not true. And so, anyway, there was some tension. And, and I, I don't do everything perfect, so. There was a second event that happened just three days after the meeting with the three pastors on February 25th. Uh, and let me say this, the number one job of a shepherd 
is to protect the sheep. Yeah. <laughs> the number one job of an elder, number one job of a pastor. And I became aware of two situations that I believed were threats to, potential threats were threats in my view to Lightbridge Church. One of them came to light to me on February 25th. A staff member, uh, inappropriate conduct uh, of the nature that should be removed from the staff team. Uh, the day that I found out about it, I sat uh, meeting with the elders and one other senior leader on the team. I explained to them what had taken place and I said, listen, we need to get this guy off the team. I wanna, I wanna care for him, we wanna cover him with counseling, we can be generous with severance and all that, but he does need to leave the team. It's a, it's a threat to the church. And I was outnumbered and outvoted and he stayed on the team. I then consulted the church attorney and the church attorney, I explained what happened, the church attorney said, you gotta get that person off the team for the safety of the church. Again, some time and some weeks go by, um, some more details came out about some other potential alleged uh, behavior. I brought that to the elders and then um, that didn't change anything. So then I asked the church attorney if he would speak to the elders, which he did, two of them. And it still didn't do anything. It didn't, it didn't change. And I knew that something had to happen. Now, as a result of, of that, some really negative things have come out. And I'm just, I'm looking in the room and I'm not sure I should say uh, that I should say it. Um, some, some accusations. Well, this is some young people here. Um, our student pastor, Gil, and myself, as a result of the situation not being handled at the right time in the right way, rumors start to spread. It's only natural. That's why I said the first day I heard it, this is a threat to our church. I've been in ministry 23 years. Here's how you handle this. It wasn't handled six, six weeks ago. Rumors started to spread, in, not in our church. Rumors worse than that in the community. On social media. Our student pastor, people were saying, I think he might be a predator. That word started to get thrown around. And then people started saying the senior pastor must be a predator because he got fired. That's why he got fired. That was on social media. People in the community, multiple people, I can testify, have spoken to people in our church and have said, we hear that your senior pastor was fired. And I can't even say it in this room because of what he tried to do to underage girls and he got caught. Those are rumors out in the community. And as a result, LifeBridge, God's gonna repair the reputation. It's his bride, but right now in the community, there's rumors and they didn't have to happen. So that was a threat and that was a second event that created more tension. The third event um, on March 24th, I brought to the elders concerns that I had with a staff member. They were verifiable, they were uh, important enough to me to bring to the elders. When I brought them those concerns, I, I, I went through the concerns, and then I said, now I would like to bring that staff member in right now so that we can speak with that staff person, with the elder, with all of us here. And that was a biblical request. And, and that request was denied in that moment. And, and it, it, it was denied, it was denied. And so, I mean, it was an evening meeting and all that, but it was denied. So then I said, well, will you, will you do an investigation on this? There were four other staff members that had brought significant concerns. Would you speak to them to verify what I'm saying? Would you guys get to the bottom of this? And so they ended up doing an investigation that was a different investigation. And they didn't do it. Um, as a result of that, you know, people have said, I don't know how much you all are tuned in and aware of a meeting seven, six or seven weeks ago. Um, but what's been accused of me was I haven't followed Matthew 18. Matthew 18 says if you have a problem with a brother, you go to them. And if you don't get resolution, you go to two or three. You take it to the elders. And if you don't get resolution there, you go to the congregation. So there was an accusation that said, and I would say it would be a misunderstanding, saying that I didn't do Matthew 18. I went straight to the elders but didn't talk to the person. It's not accurate. Um, I, there were, I went to the person with many of the events that I brought to the elders as they happened over a period of time. And so I just want to give you that because I know that's been said a lot of you wonder, gee, Ralph didn't even follow the Bible. I do the best I can. But I went to him on many occasions as they happened. Um, 
So, uh, so that's uh, Matthew 18. So from there I went to the elders and I didn't get resolution with the elders. So from there I took it to the congregation. It's a difficult decision. she doesn't need that microphone. <laughs> so, yeah. So I took my concerns to uh, a group of 12 leaders in our church. Um, they're known as the 17. Uh, if you're, I don't know to what degree you all know what's gone on, but people refer to them as a group of 17. There were 12 that I went to. Uh, they were all leaders in our church. And listen, I went to these specific people strategically. I would say every one of them, or at least almost every one of them, were good friends with our elders. Several of them were mentors to our elders. There were 11 men and one woman. And then there were some other deacons that, that wanted to sign on and, and ultimately be a part of a conversation with the elders. That's why it got to 17. But I chose those people because I believe they had influence and they had earned the right to speak into the elders. Because the, the, the staff member who had done the, the, you know, misappropriate behavior was still on the team. And when I had brought concerns about a staff member that I said, could we have this dialogue with him? Could we look into this? The elders ultimately made the decision to demote me and to remove me from my role as senior pastor and move me to teaching pastor. I don't know if everybody knew that that happened. It happened just a few days, a handful of days before I got fired. Um, and, and I'm not a perfect leader, and there'd be reasons to have a conversation about, Ralph, how can you do better as a leader? But in that environment, in that situation was demoted. And uh, anyway, I won't say more about that. Um, when I went to uh, the 12 with the information so that they could go to the elders, um, there's something that I, I just want to say about myself. I knew all the information that I brought to the elders uh, for weeks before I brought it to them. And I was deeply troubled, and my friends at church could see it. I had five or six or seven friends at church call me, text me multiple times over a three-week period and say, you doing all right? What's going on? Tell us what's happening. I didn't say a word to anybody in the congregation about any of it. I went to the elders. It was when the elders in my, as I'm the shepherd of the flock, they weren't taking care of it, that I went to 12 people. So I was not out trying to do anything other than get movement so that the church could be so, um, so these 12 that became the 17, we'll just call them 17, they wrote a very respectful letter to the elders, said, hey, Ralph's informed us of some things. We've got a couple of, uh, could we meet with you? We'd like to understand your decision making. We're quite sure there must be more information. We'd like to understand why you've made the decisions, you know, with this young person on the staff and, you know, with Ralph being moved out of his role as senior pastor. And so, um, and I feel guilty because I'm used to being up here preaching and trying to but this is just, I'm just giving you a report, I guess. Um, okay, so on April 18th and 19th, there were back-to-back -back elder meetings. That was a Sunday after the three services and then a Monday night. The elders wanted to know, they were preparing for the meeting with the 17, and they wanted to know from me, tell us everything you told these guys about these two situations. And I didn't tell them. I said, listen, you guys know the details. Just be ready to talk about them. Um, and I frustrated them, and I angered them. And... Uh, I didn't feel safe in those meetings. And maybe that's on me, but, and, and maybe I made a mistake because I didn't tell them. But I just didn't feel safe telling them. I said, listen, the guys are gonna meet with the guys on Tuesday, meet with them and have the conversation. So anyway, uh, that was a Sunday. We met on Monday night and they, they fired me on Monday night. They fired me on a Zoom call on uh, <laughs> April 19th. Uh, and um, yeah. So, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't mean that to hit the way that no, I was just, I was just sharing information. Um, so that was April 19th at night. On April 20th, uh, two letters went out. One to the entire congregation from the elders, and another from a ministry director within the church. I'm sorry, the entire database. Um, I have a number of 18,000 people in my head. I haven't seen the database in my close. 20, 22,000 people got a letter explaining the difficulties on staff, the elders have been trying to work through it, and then the paragraph that really I'm trying to get over uh, 
they took to 22,000 people, they said, that we're trying to fix everything. However, Pastor Ralph continued with his divisive actions, demonstrated a lack of humility and willingness to embrace reconciliation. Therefore, again, after seeking God's guidance, the elder team made the difficult decision that Pastor Ralph should no longer continue with Life Bridge Church. So, I, just, just so you know, this is a little bit emotive, but this is my story. I have family members that watch the services every week that are either nominal believers, if there is such a thing, but you know what I mean, or they're not believers. <coughs> but they can't believe little Ralph is up there on the screen, and you know, he's funny, and the music is beautiful. And they watch every week. They're online viewers. They got the letter. We, we, we have friends all over the world because we live in China. People in Australia, Taiwan, China, Scotland, uh, Finland, Canada, all over the world got that letter about me. And that letter will never be taken back. And anywhere I go to get a job, that will probably follow me. <coughs> so uh, uh, just a ministry director that same day sent out a letter explaining to everybody that I had been let go. And uh, the letter said this, the part that I'm having a hard time getting over. As of last night, and the elders repeated attempts to reconcile Ralph with the majority of the staff, he was let go for his continued refusal to reconcile. So, some more accusations. I'm divisive, I lack humility, I lack a willingness to embrace reconciliation. It was also said that evening to the congregation when that congregational meeting happened that I wasn't at, uh, that uh, it was so disappointing for people to realize that I cared more about power than I did about God. It's difficult, difficult. None of these statements have been clarified, corrected, or apologized for, and they're all untrue. And I, I see how this is hitting. I'm, I'm not trying. One of my prayers tonight is that I wouldn't stir any like emotive reactions. We're going to go back to Ephesians when we finish. <laughs> This is the truth. This is what's been happening uh, in my world, attempting to leave life first over the last three months, um, you know, when all this happened. Um, while I'm talking about accusations, let me just throw a few more out, um, just, just in case you've heard them, and if you haven't, you might. The staff team has told other people who have now told other people that Ralph comes to uh, staff meetings disheveled and with bloodshot eyes. Now, I do what I can with my hair, but this thing's a mess. <laughs> this is a mess. I see people with all this nice hair, and I get mad. I like I'm jealous. <laughs> and so uh, another person said, you know, I, I saw Ralph downtown Winter Garden, and he looked all disheveled there. And so I've had a conversation recently with someone who said, people are asking if you're an alcoholic. Like, this is... This is rumors. These are rumors. She would never let me get away with it. And listen, I know alcohol is a problem for the people in this room, so I'm not making light of it. Actually, I think a really careful eye on that type of thing with his family. His family, he comes from a family of alcoholics. So I'm very, very aware of the situation and keep an eye out anyway. I mean, it's just that's something that is a family trait. So let me talk, let me talk about this for a minute. Because um, I have the right to defend myself. I, I, I have shared openly and honestly in Sunday morning church services and in smaller gatherings with people my story. I came from an alcoholic, alcoholic dysfunctional family. I did a lot of heavy drinking from the time I was 18 till about 22, kind of lingered into 24. I have no problem with drinking. And in the last three years, I've had, I would say, an accumulation of two glasses of wine in the last three years, tops. It might maybe be close to three. I do not drink beer in any of my recent past. I do not drink any hard alcohol, okay? Um, I have suffered my whole life with extreme allergies. I mean, just sneezing and just, and it's kind of ironic that a golfer, I'm allergic to everything in the grass. It's just God's sense of humor, right? So I went through a period of time in my young adult life where I went and got shots every week to try to deal with the allergies. I finally decided I'd just rather sneeze than deal with the allergies. So I keep Visine in business. I deal with sneezing. Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 
I always load my eyes up with Visine before I came out here. I did it. I do it every Sunday morning. But uh, about five, six years ago, I was at my eye doctor, and he said, uh, don't overdo it with the Visine because it can end up long term. It might end up causing some negative effects. So I don't use the Visine all the time. Um, I, I was in the lobby before preaching on a Sunday morning. It's probably like a year and a half ago. And one of the guys who knows me walking over, we were talking, he said, Ralph, your eyes are really red. And I ran back up and I did the Visine because I had forgotten to do it. So my eyes are red. I have allergies. I, I suffer with allergies. It's a minor suffer. I can't use the word suffer, but my eyes are red all the time. And I use Visine. Anytime I'm going to be in public, I use Visine. Um, Winter Garden. I live a mile from downtown Winter Garden. I'll jog down there in my t-shirt and shorts. I'll walk down there, typically praying while I'm walking. And somebody seeing me down there on the day off with my hair tossed around in a t-shirt, saying he's disheveled. I, I heard his eyes are bloodshot. Kind of stuff that happens when people just want to push something out. Uh, but I'll tell you what, I'm grateful for my testimony because God delivered me uh, from a path that would, would have been so destructive. I'll never stop telling that story. I told it the Thursday before I got fired for a group of about 35 to 50 people. Celebrate Recovery is one of the most powerful ministries at church. And I told the people of every place I could be, Celebrate Recovery is what you want to do. You know why? By the time you get to Celebrate Recovery, you're going, God, will you help me? Because I don't know what to do. And I've been there many years ago. Okay, so I'm taking too long. I, I don't know how to say this one, but I think you're, you, you have heard it or may hear this. Um, and there's young people in the room. Um, I have had three absolute credible leaders in our church tell me that two different senior leaders in our church have said about the relationship that Joe Jackson and I have. They have said that relationship is so unhealthy and so strange and it's like a homosexual relationship. Oh, man. What? There is, um, there is, what is it? I wish we would have heard that. Oh, that you said? As a pastor, the most important thing you have as, your, as a pastor is your name. And as I go out to look for another job, get another job, I have to face all these. There are social media posts about me that future, form, future employers may dig up and see. It's disappointing, but God's bigger. Amen. There's another... Um, you know, I won't call it an accusation. Say there's another, there's another challenge. There's, well, let me just say that there's a challenge that's been brought to me by the elders, and I believe it's appropriate. It's an appropriate challenge. So, Ralph, you you can be really stubborn. You can be argumentative. Now, they they'll use the word insubordinate, and I don't I don't agree with that. But here's what I want to tell you. I've been told by by the elders uh, consistently over four years, Ralph, when you when you get a hold of something, you don't let go, and you're like you just won't move. And you know what? I, I think to some degree. It's a blind spot I need to work on. It's why it's difficult. I understand. I understand. But still, I, I need to embrace that. Um, so, so that's an accusation. You know, you hear if you hear that, you know, all the elders say, there's probably some truth because they all say it. Um, it here, here's the thing. I'm, I'm not a confrontational person. Um, if you're going to lead, you have to be able to embrace confrontation. And it's not my default position. My default position is to encourage and hug and let's all get along. And so when, when I have to confront somebody else, I'm not making an excuse. I'm just telling you, as I've prayed about this, I feel like God has shown me the picture of King David trying to fight in Saul's armor. Ralph, it's not your armor. So when I have to do it in a leadership situation, I'm clunky. I can't bend my arms the right way. It's, it's heavy. I don't know what, you know. And so I'm not making an excuse. I'm just saying I prayed about it, and, and I need to work on that. That's an area where I can improve. 
but what Melinda said is not untrue because if I think there's a staff member that's behaved inappropriately and I want to get him help, I need to come off the staff for the sake of the team and I get opposed, I'm not going to back down. <laughs> That was, so that was kind of the, some other accusations. Now there's some more, I'll skip them. Um, uh, that I'm a liar, you can, you can determine that if you know me. Um, so April 19th, I was fired. April 20th, the two letters went out during the day. April 20th that night was a meeting. That meeting was a response, a result of the 17 emailing the elders saying, can we have a meeting with you? We'd like to better understand your decision making. We recognize uh, the weight and the heaviness of being elders. We respect that you've stepped into that role. We'd just like to understand better your decision making. There was some back and forth, but the meeting was set for that Tuesday night, April 20th. There was a meeting for four elders and 17 uh, people, actually 16, one was out of town. And Well, but the deacons actually got added in more exposed to them. Yeah. So, so let me handle this this way. The meeting was supposed to be 16 leaders in the congregation with the four elders, like in an ABS room, like in a small room. That meeting was moved to the auditorium. My question is, who moved it? The staff ended up being the majority of the staff ended up being up being at the meeting. My question is, who invited the staff to a meeting between leaders and the elders, a private meeting to have a private conversation? But the staff ended up there. The staff and their spouses, majority of them, uh, majority of them had their spouses. Not every staff member was there, but there was a good number of them. They were on stage with the elders. Who made the decision that they would be there? I've asked that question, I've never gotten the answer. That was supposed to be a meeting with 20 people. The level of betrayal that I feel as a result of what took place at that meeting with people that I had served alongside of and served under as the elders is something I never expected to see or experience in my life. And I'm not a perfect person. Why did that meeting happen? Why did so many people show up? I'm not telling you everything I know because I don't want to be overly, create too much energy in the room, but that was wrong. It was, the, it was the day after I got fired and that meeting was shaped by whoever designed it. And you can tell the shape of the meeting that was designed based on what happened on the front end. What happened on the back end was unexpected. <laughs> On the front end, there was a prepared letter, read. It was very derogatory towards me. Then there was a second anonymous letter from a staff person or staff people I didn't quite understand. Very derogatory towards me. Some staff people ended up having speaking roles in it. But then something different happened. The congregation spoke up and started to ask questions. Yeah. was developing before the meeting, uh, three or four people called me, several were here, and they said, Ralph, we heard there's a meeting at the church, the elders are going to be there, um, can we go, is that something we can go to? I told everybody that called me, three or four different calls, uh, no, 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 that's just for a small group of people don't go, but then as we got later in the afternoon, we started hearing people were going to, lots of people were coming, um, and it turned out to be, I heard, 270, 300 people. My, my two oldest daughters, who are 18 and 16, uh, I, I had to tell my kids, I sat my kids and I said, listen, by the end of tonight, uh, you're going to start hearing some really negative things about me. Don't let it bother you. Most pastors have to have that conversation at some point. And quite honestly, if you can't handle criticism, you can't leave. So I'm, I'm okay with that part. right? But um, my two oldest girls wanted to go to the meeting. And I said, no, these kind of meetings, you, no, you're not allowed to go. So, yeah. So they went. <laughs> yeah. 
They stayed outside. They didn't go in. And they walked the building like I did six days a week for four years. And my daughters cried, not cried, they cried and they prayed for two and a half hours walking outside the building, sitting on the curbs. You know what they were praying? That truth would be told. Nobody has to convince them that I'm not perfect, but I'm not what that was what was going on there. That was wrong. That was wrong. We've raised our kids. To believe that the kingdom of God exists. And what we've experienced as a family at LifeBridge on the darker side of it at the worst times has challenged the belief in my children that there really is a kingdom of God. But listen, what happened the second half or the last two thirds of that night restored my kids' belief that God exists and the kingdom exists because there's praise for the Anybody riled up, but I'm, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. <laughs> now, in, in, in that meeting, I'm pretty close to done with what, what I'm saying here, but in that meeting, uh, it was made clear from a majority of the staff that Ralph is a horrific leader. Ralph is a terrible leader. Guys, I have plenty of deficiencies as a leader. There's no chance I'm one of the top 10 best leaders in this room right now. There's no chance. Um, I am not a type A personality. Um, I'm a relational leader. Now, if, if you like me, you say that I am steady and consistent. <laughs> if you like me, you say I'm steady and consistent. If you don't like me, you say I'm undecisive. Indecisive. <laughs> She, she proofs all my messages. <laughs> so I have plenty to work on in my leadership. But to represent my leadership in that way, I'm not going to try to prove it to you. That's grossly unfair. It's grossly unfair. No, nobody has said it to me, and I shouldn't say it to you. I've been told not to say this. I'm going to say it anyway. Just, I just want to say, when I showed up, the church was hurting. It wasn't doing that great. And two and a half, three years later, it was doing really well. I must have been doing something. showed up, you know, I think my slowness, my steadiness, and my patience, and my wiring with an unusual level of patience, I think God brought me here because that's what life was needed. I, I, I don't know this, but I just, as I prayed about it, I think, you know, if, if a type A had come in four years ago when I showed up, it might have blown up. It might have been all different. Um, about a year and a half into my time at LifeBridge, it was a really difficult stretch, and that's fine, because at least you have to have difficult stretches. But it was really difficult, where I was like, I can't do this anymore. Um, I told Melinda, it's not that, like, it's hard. I've lost heart. And when you lose heart, that's a lot different. And I took a day off. I called Ron Campbell. I said, Ron, run the meeting. I got on my motorcycle. I went into Lake County, and I went to the woods. I went to the woods. I took my helmet off and I was walking through the woods praying and I was so mad. I was mad at God. I was, I was saying, God, and, and on my motorcycle ride up to Lake County, here's, here were my thoughts. I, I don't know what I was. I'm 56 now, so I was 54. I said, God, what do I do next? Where do I, this is on my resume. What am I going to do next? How am I going to get insurance for my family? That's what I was thinking. Thank you. That's what I was thinking at the time on the motorcycle ride. I got to the woods and I was saying, God, what? 
What have you done? I said, God, I'm at the Red Sea. And if you don't part the waters, I'm dead here. As I said that, my cell phone in my pocket dinged. And I took it out, and it was somebody at the church that I had lunch with one time who had some adult children. And this person said, hey, I think you remember my son. I had met him once and shook his hand. He said, um, he's got a word for you. He said, I don't know if you're into this kind of thing, but, but here's his number. <laughs> I'm out in the woods in Lake County yelling at God and saying you better do something and the phone dings and somebody says I've got to work for God. <laughs> that happened. <laughs> so that happened just like that. And this person said, I don't know if you're into this kind of thing. I said, listen, just give it to me. So he, he said a number of things, but the, the main point was this. He said, Ralph, in this part of town, there's a spiritual stronghold. He said, many, many good pastors have left this area. He said, the Lord told me to tell you that he's gifted you with an unusual level of patience. And you are not to leave Life Bridge Church. Like, that happened. That happened. That was one of five stories like that I could tell. I'm only telling them one. Um, because there, there's been a lot that's happened that's hurt so many people. So many of you are hurt. So many on the staff team are hurt. God says no matter what happens, you love and you forgive and you reconcile. I'll make a commitment in front of all of you. That's the path I'm on with each person. Now, I'm not saying it started yet, but, but it started. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get lots of reactions. I wasn't expecting that. You can hold me accountable. I'm I'm committed to that. I've already had conversations with four of the now six elders saying, can we get together soon? Let's start to repair this thing on a personal level. Um, so many people have been hurt. You guys have been hurt. There's been a lot that's happened. There's more things I could talk about. I, I don't want to do that. Um, I just want to kind of just a couple more comments, a couple more comments. Um, the investigation took place, right? I don't know how long it took. I, I was playing golf. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It might be a little lighthearted. I was being lighthearted. People were saying, well, what are you doing? He said, I said, hey, for the first time in 25 years, I'm being paid to play golf again. <laughs> no, I didn't. So, so there was an investigation. And I, I'm, I'm not going to – just just a couple of quick comments about the investigation. People worked really hard. A lot of work was done. Uh, at the end of the day, it wasn't all that I had hoped it would be. And I can say that honestly, but still be respectful of all the hard work that was done. Um, I will tell you that I was told at the beginning of the process to submit character witnesses. My character was coming under attack. I was told to submit character witnesses. I gave 14 witnesses with their phone numbers and told who they were in my life. A number of them, four or five, are sitting in this room. They're members of, of, of LifeBridge Church. Others were my previous employers and people who had reported to me in previous locations. And none of those references were called. I'm not trying to create emotive stuff, but I want you to understand why I made the decision not to accept the offer that was given to me to return. I don't believe it. Okay. <laughs> every elder and every person on staff, I love. I believe the enemies put a wedge. And I have no doubt I played a part in, in helping to create the wedge. I'm guilty too. We need to love each other. <coughs> These are the things that have happened. So as Melinda and I were just, I mean, just heartbroken, praying, how can we come back? I was having conversations with the elders. And, um, you know, the investigation and the results of the investigation – um, but one of the things that the elders had promised the church in writing was that they would have the deacons to be on an advisory board that would receive the information from the investigation. And then they didn't do that. They took a representative. They took three. Um, and for me, I'm just saying for me personally, that was a breach of trust. Just for me personally. You don't have to pick that up. For me personally, that was a breach of trust. Um, and then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the, you know, Brian Treadwell, who I love, and he's been wonderful to me over the last several months. He's a 
Good night. It's 8 o'clock. <laughs> Anybody whose phone going off, you get 5% off your tithe next week. <laughs> so just, just so you know, my, my family, we prayed and we said, let's do the 8 o'clock prayer early. So let me, let me keep going. We're going to pray at the end, okay? Um, I'm so glad phones went off. Um, so Brian rotated off the team, uh, and he's a good man. And um, the three remaining elders, they have a huge workload. This has been so difficult on them. Um, you know, uh, people have, I've heard... People say that I've tried to stir up the 17, I've tried to stir up the congregation against the elders. No, I have not. I am telling the truth in love tonight, but I have not. I went to a meeting of the 17 guys about three weeks ago, and I spoke first. And what I said to them was, guys, the elders don't need one more letter telling them what they've done wrong. They don't need one more letter telling them that somebody thinks they should resign. When you see them on Sunday morning, you walk up right up to them, you put your hand on your shoulder, on their shoulder, you say, I'm praying for you. And that is what I said in private to a small group of people. I'm not perfect, but that's how I lead. And I said, it doesn't mean you can't say something you need to say to them, but you need to tell them you love them, you're praying for them, you need to pray for them right there. So we'll, we'll repair our relationships. But here's the thing. The three remaining elders several weeks ago took three of the previous elders and they put them back on the elder team. And my reading of the bylaws, it's clear that there's a process. Even for bringing elders who were previous, there's a process 30 days in front of the congregation. This is transparency, right? This is, I'm not trying to be mean. This is transparency. The elders said, hey, we're going to be transparent. I'm being transparent. Um, I'm telling you why I'm not accepting the position. Because I said, guys, you can't. The bylaws, you can't do that. No, we can do that. Well, for me... That is a breach of trust. So ultimately, I love LifeBridge Church. So happy to see all of you tonight. I wish I was telling a different message, but I'm so happy to see you. 560 of us tonight. <laughs> I can tell you stories about each and individual staff member that would make you so proud of the way they love people and the way they serve. And they're not perfect either. But for me, ultimately, my decision not to accept the offer, I was offered the position of senior pastor again, and I'm not taking it because ultimately, I, I don't know how to say this the right way, my integrity will not allow me to endorse the vision. Sometimes the fog is in front, you don't know what you're doing, but this last stretch of time has been too much for me. I've been willing to, to fight and serve for, for four years, but this breach of trust to me personally is something that I can no longer serve with. So that's why, that's my answer is to, hey, here's some history, here's what's gone on. Here's why ultimately Mullen and I made the heartbreaking decision. And so, you know, what do, so what do, what do we do from here? What, is, what, what do Mullen and I do from here? Well, you know, quite a few years back, we were serving at Discovery Church. We, we planted this campus 16 years ago. And we felt like God was calling us to China. And I'm telling you what, when we started to pray about that and we felt that, it was like we were sitting on a rocket and the fuel, the fix, it was like we couldn't, we were being compelled to China. We, we couldn't not go to China. All of our thoughts, everything, it was China. I mean, we had to go. It was an amazing adventure. We've come back. So now you get to this point. Everything inside of me says, Ralph, I called you to pastor in southwest Orlando. And that's what we're going to do.
incredible privilege to, to shepherd and pastor, and so and, and to do it with Melinda is amazing. Um, so you know, so. <laughs> One of the things I prayed back before I came out that, you know, this isn't the kind of message, it's not taking the message, it's a report, but it's isn't the kind of talk you, heal, you hear and you go, boy, God healed me tonight. You know, it's not, but I prayed that healing would start, but back here, I prayed that God would supernaturally heal somebody. I think you guys have brought some healing to my family tonight. <laughs> The name, at least right now, is Crossroads Impact Ministries. Here, here's the thing. I stood in Israel, in the heart of Israel, in 2015, and this incredible dynamic teacher told us that we were standing in the center of the Fertile Crescent. You know the ancient Fertile Crescent? Do you know that Egypt is on one side with the Nile River, on the other side is the Euphrates and, you know, Babylon and all, Iraq and all that? <laughs> I can't help myself. I didn't even know I was doing it. Bring the whiteboard in. So, God brought Israel, his people, in a dark and broken world, and he separated them from that. And he brought them somewhere specific. He brought them to the promised land. Guys, the promised land, when Israel landed there in 1450 B.C., it was the crossroads of the known world. The international highways from Egypt to Babylon, everybody passed through Israel. God put them there strategically at the crossroads of the world so that they would be a witness to the one true God. When Jesus started his ministry, he positioned himself in Capernaum at the top of the, of the Sea of Galilee. The international coastal highway goes along the Mediterranean, cuts through the Valley of Armageddon, and then comes right up through Capernaum and off into Babylon. Jesus positioned himself at the crossroads to do his ministry. When Paul, when Paul did his ministry and traveled all over what we know as Turkey, the place he spent the most time, three years, was Ephesus. Ephesus was the New York City of the day. It was where the ground traffic north and south and the sea traffic all converged in the Roman Empire on that continent where Turkey is. And John and Mary, history, uh, church history tells us John then went there and lived out his days preaching in Ephesus and died there. Guys, God's people are supposed to go to the crossroads of the world in order to have an impact so people who don't know God can see God through you. So that's how we got the name anyway. <laughs> so, you know, everybody's going to say, hey, what, you know, what does this look like? Well, we do have some ideas. I, I want to start teaching again. Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> and <laughs> book of Revelation, yeah. Thank you. It's a privilege to teach them. It is. So, uh, you know, here's the thing. I'm kind of like done. I'm going to ask David to come up because I, I had this much information in my head and that was it. Um, but but um, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for life, Rich. Oh, what did I do? Something wrong? Yes. I I'm praying for you. I'm praying for life, Rich. And I believe God's called us to continue to minister. That's exactly what we're going to do. And we'll be able to let you know soon more of what that looks like. But maybe David's going to wrap it up. Melinda, would you pray for the nation? <laughs> God, we submit to you. We submit
submit our families, we submit our lives, and we pray for our nation. Father, we turn hearts to you. We ask for a Saul to Paul conversion for those in office who don't know you. May you be glorified in and through us. And may we have an impact here and in our nation and the rest of the world. In Jesus' name. tonight transpired in about 48 hours. Um, you can only imagine just the logistical things that are going on. So what we want to do, e even what we're going to do now, put, the, put that slide up, please, Tom. So this is an email address. There is a QR code. We did not, we were not able to tap into Discovery's technology with my limited technology. There will be a laptop outside if you want to hit the QR code. Um, what this does is allow your name to be captured so that we can communicate what's coming next. All right, so if you want to stay in touch with what God is leading Ralph and Melinda to do, this either email your information here and your name, email, and phone number would be good. Or you can take your phone and just turn it to camera. And it's a small laptop. And again, we, I, we apologize that we don't have a production crew to make it all nice and perfect. Yeah. So here's what we do have. God calls men like this to equip the believers for the work of the ministry. People have asked, you know, uh, what's coming next? Are there going to be small groups? Are there going to be gatherings like this? Uh, many have said, if we want to contribute, if we want to give, give us your name, we'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously. Um, it's not like they had some plan in place. I will attest, and several of us who have walked a little closer through this can attest that they've really been working and hearing what God is saying. And so now, God's a God of new beginnings. Amen. And for some of us, there will be a new beginning. Tonight, Ralph, I feel we did, several of us prayed with him, and, and I hope, I hope you experience healing in our heart. Look, we really, he said he, he forgot, but he said he was going to go back to Ephesians 4. <laughs> All right? So I'll remind us to go back to Ephesians 4. God commands us to love. All right? There's some things that are hurtful. There's some things we've been walking through. But God commands me to love. For me and my house, we've made the same decision that I, I'm not comfortable where I was. I bless God for what was there. I will say, my man, when he started talking about crossroads, <laughs> he needed his map. <laughs> Welcome back, Rob. <laughs> here, please be respectful for each other as you leave. Uh, thank you, Discovery Share Survey. Like we said, in a short time frame, we were looking for a place, we found a place that cost a bunch of money, and we didn't really want to impose on Discovery. Did We didn't want to make them feel like they were in the middle, and they were graciously uh, have, have done this tonight. So we're very, very grateful. Thank you very much. I'm going to pray. 
and then we will trust that God's going to lead in next steps. And I would encourage you, you know, Scripture tells us in Acts that the, the Bereans were lauded because they studied and made their own decisions. And so you need to, you just need to pray and ask God to lead you. That's what we are Christ followers. And we've heard him say, stay dusty. If you've never heard that message, it's a wonderful message. Right? You and I need to stay dusty. We need to follow what God's calling us to do. And you need to do what God's saying, what's best for you to be able to uh, fulfill the ministry that God's given each of us as we pursue our walk with Jesus. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are a mighty, mighty, mighty God. We thank you that righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. We thank you that love and kindness and truth go before you. We thank you that you are always pursuing us. Incredible that the God of the universe is always pursuing us. Give each one of us wisdom and the next steps we're to take. God, grant us grace and humility and love as we process what we've been through and bring each one of us into deeper, closer, more precious relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus that we are covered in your blood and because of your righteousness we stand in your righteous robes as priesthood of believers that can access your throne. We honor you as a great God. We thank you for Ralph and Melinda. We thank you for the healing that has started tonight. And one more time, we pray specifically for them and their family and their children. Heal their hearts and their emotions and their minds and may the kingdom of God be enhanced in each one of their lives, even through the difficult time. We love you that you're that kind of a God. In Jesus' name, amen. Good night.